To see all the stars, all the heroes in folk music, you can't just look where the spotlight falls. Chart the history of modern American folk music, and at nearly every juncture, the face of Harold Leventhal can be seen peeking out from behind the curtains. In the 1950s, he managed the Weavers, from small nightclub act to the most popular singing group in the country, and, with their music as his only weapon, helped break the back of the blacklist. He was involved in the creation of the Newport Folk Festival, from which much of the 60s folk revival was launched. He managed the careers of Pete Seeger, Theodore Bickell, Cisco Houston, Alan Arkin, Judy Collins, and Arlo Guthrie. He serves as executor of the Woody Guthrie estate and with the Guthrie family, founded the Woody Guthrie Foundation and Archives. As a concert promoter, he presented the first major New York concerts of Bob Dylan, the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makem, and Nana Muscori. Harold describes the epic of his life as merely a varied career. He plugged songs for Irving Berlin and owns the publishing rights to the National Anthem of India. He hooked up band leader Benny Goodman with a hungry young crooner named Frank Sinatra and was the first promoter to bring Jacques Brel to America. A varied career. He offered his thoughts on Harry Truman to an inquisitive Mahatma Gandhi and his thoughts on Gandhi to an inquisitive Martin Luther King. He produced civil rights benefits with Harry Belafonte Duke Ellington, Mahalia Jackson, and Tony Bennett. A very career. He won Oscars as producer of the movie Bound for Glory, a Grammy for producing the 1989 Columbia tribute to Woody Guthrie and Leadbelly, and an Emmy for co-producing the TV documentary We Shall Overcome. He also produced the hit film Alice's Restaurant and the classic Weaver's documentary Wasn't That a Time? a varied career. In 1919, Harold Leventhal was born to poor Jewish immigrants in Ellenville, New York, the youngest of five children. Two months later, his father died. His mother worked as a janitor and soon moved the family to even poorer quarters in the Lower East Side and later the Bronx. It was said then that any child raised on those mean streets grew up either to be a gangster or a red. Harold was no gangster. He was drawn to the far left through the Zionist movement and was soon being kicked out of high school for his activities with the Young Communist League. It was through the far left that he made many of his best business contacts and often explains his success by saying, the left are pretty good organizers. After a couple of years as a song plugger for Irving Berlin, he joined the army in World War II, serving as a corporal for the Signal Corps in India. After the war, Harold wanted to combine his showbiz savvy with his progressive politics, and that drew him to folk music. When he went to the village vanguard to see a new quartet called the Weavers, banjo player Pete Seeger immediately asked him to manage them. They were soon on Decca Records, topping the charts with hits such as Good Night Irene, so long it's been good to know you, and kisses sweeter than wine. Their progressive politics made them among the first victims of the growing anti-communist hysteria. In 1951, the quartet was officially blacklisted by the infamous publication Red Channels. In 1955, at the height of the blacklist power, Harold decided to produce the Weavers in concert. Town Hall turned him down flat. A lesser promoter might have thought smaller after that, but Harold trotted right over to Carnegie Hall, which told him that if he put up the money, he could rent the space. On December 24th, 1955, the Weavers performed at Carnegie Hall what must be considered one of the most important musical concerts in American history. The hall was so crowded, extra seats were placed on the stage. Industry heavyweights, knowing the FBI would take names of those who attended, came anyway, determined to break the power of the blacklist. The show was also heard by a new generation of musicians. In attendance that night were teenagers, Peter Yarrow and Mary Travers, who would not actually meet for five years and then form Peter, Paul, and Mary. Vanguard released the concert on record and it profoundly influenced nearly all the artists who would become the 60s revival's first stars, including Joan Baez, the Kingston Trio, and Tom Paxton. In 1954, Harold, 
who had become friends with the great songwriter Woody Guthrie, used money from song royalties to set up a trust fund for Woody's children. He worked with wife Marjorie Guthrie to nurse Woody through the final years of his tragic battle with Huntington's disease. Daughter Nora Guthrie remembers always knowing that Harold's number was the first to call if anything went wrong. Harold employed Guthrie's son, Arlo, as an office boy, and whenever Pete Seeger dropped by, the two played music for hours. After Arlo became a star, managed from the beginning by Harold, it was he who suggested the two team up for concerts. When Pete Seeger is asked the most important thing people should know about Harold, he says, his concern for the future of the world. He is a humanist, and in the deepest sense of the word, a patriot. Like a loving elder, Harold now concerns himself with passing his work on. With the Guthrie family, he created the Woody Guthrie Foundation and Archive to fight the disease that killed Woody, and to preserve his vast repository of songs and writings. He raised over $100,000 to fund and staff the Archive, where he works alongside his daughter, Judy, and Woody's daughter, Nora. When Harold Leventhal is asked what he would like us to know about his varied career, he does not cite achievements or drop the names of famous people who proudly call him co-worker, friend, and fellow traveler. He says just this, that I've tried to do the right thing with the people I've worked with and with the world around me, to do things the right way, the honest way. Please.